God bless you. Welcome back to Temple Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> We're very excited. We got the men's room tonight. We're going to be talking about mental health. Elder Graves got us just sharing a lot of information with us tonight. And today, when you talk about mental health, sometimes men, we shy away from that. But the same way we take care of our physical being, we must also take care of our mental being. So on behalf of our bishop, Bishop Matthew Odom Sr., to the memory of our first lady, Lady Sheila Odom, our executive pastor, Overseer Annette Salter, the Temple Nation, we welcome you to the men's room. Be blessed. All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We are here today with my brother, Elder Mario Graves, and we are in the men's room uh, discussing today about mental health. Am I healthy? The major question, especially as it pertains to men. So, uh, Elder Graves, if you can, just uh, let everybody know who you are and uh, and what you do. Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, just like you said, my name is Mario Grace, and I am a, a licensed professional counselor. I've actually been working in the mental health field ever since 2014. Um, while I work with all age groups, I do typically specialize working with children and adolescents. Um, I, as far as that, I've been also working, um, worked a little bit with children in the foster care, uh, in foster care, and also I work in home counseling and right now working private practice. Wow, that's great, man. That's great. We need more like you. We appreciate the work you do. And you also serve, of course, with the Temple of Glory with our youth ministry. And uh, you work with various ages, but primarily third to fifth grade kids and also middle school kids as well. And we really do appreciate the work you do. You're an elder in the Lord's Church and just doing a fantastic job. So uh, we're glad to have you on board and uh, really interested in hearing what you have to say as it pertains to mental health. Mental health is something, as men, we don't always like to talk about. A lot of times we put our hands on the plow and we hide behind sometimes work. You know, we work, we work, we work. And sometimes we work to where even when we have problems, we just work our way through it instead of really identifying the problems and finding out that, hey, there are some things that we really need to consider, some things we really need to look at, become more aware of because, I got an issue. One of the things I think is, is tough for us sometimes is we really don't want to admit that we got issues. So if you can, as we start this particular segment, uh, number one, we want to let everybody know that this is not a counseling session. This is just a discussion that we're having in our men's room. So we do want to put that disclaimer out there. Uh, however, we do have a professional on board that will give us some good insights as we move forward. Now, that being said, if you can just explain to everyone, explain to us what exactly is mental health. Define mental health for us. Okay. Well, well it's a, uh, as far as mental health, that can, it's a pretty broad um, statement. But if I had to kind of narrow it down a little bit, it will be your psychological and emotional well-being. You know, how are you relating uh, to different things and situations you know, in your environment or whether how you're thinking about it, how you're responding to it, uh, how you're reacting to it is it in a normal range uh, when it comes to things. And so that will be like a very broad definition of what mental health is. But it's a pretty uh, multifaceted um, kind of thing to kind of define. So just help us as we're in the men's room now. Why is it so difficult for the brethren, for us? To really talk about mental health, why is it so tough? Why is it so hard uh, for for the brother and the European to discuss mm -hmm. mental health? I mean, I think it's several reasons. I think one of the big reasons why it's really tough, I think, for uh, the men, and, and I think just in people in general, I think it's the stigma behind it. Uh, there's a lot of thought when you when you start talking about mental health and somebody needing you know assistance or just talking about it it's hard to talk about issues and problems that you're dealing with, just in general, it's just really tough. You know, don't want, no one wants to be seen as the quote unquote, the, somebody who's going through issues or feel like that they're weak or anything like that. And those are some of the stigmas that kind of come to it, you know, that you have to, you know, like if I have to go to counseling, you know, I got issues and problems, I'm weak and I need to talk to people. It's a lot of different stigmas. Yeah, that's one thing is for, you know, the, some of the negative, I guess some of the negative mindset of having to go and needing help. I think the other part of it is, is that, um, that, you know, it's a pride issue as well, too. You know, there's a lot of pride in that. 
you know, a lot of times people want to fix things and handle problems themselves. And it's really hard to sit there and say, I need help from another person. That's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and, and some people, it just has to do with pride. Some people know they have issues and problems, but they just really don't want to have to really address it because they're kind of admitting something about themselves. And I think also another part of that is, is that, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, when it comes to, especially when it comes to men in the African-American community, I think there's some mistrust of the medical field, you know, due to things that's happened in the past. And I think that's also a big factor of why, you know, a lot of times men kind of, you know, don't really want to, you know, go to the medical field because there, there has been some things that's happened in the past where they haven't been treated the best. You know, I don't think I have to give a history lesson. I think we all know, you know, some of the incidents has happened. But, you know, that's just one of those things that kind of hold people back a little bit, uh, you know, from kind of going into that direction. Wow. That's you, you're exactly right. And you I mean, it's uh wow. That's powerful because you're right. When you when when I think instantly, you know, of mm -hmm. course, prior to really having the knowledge of what mental health consists of and, you know, mm -hmm. And, and that sort of thing, even when you get into mental illnesses, sure. as a kid, you think of someone with mental problems as being crazy mm -hmm. or in other words, cray cray. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so when the truth of the matter is, we all got a little cray cray. In it. So we all got a little crazy, but that's really not, you know, that's not the case, you know, because mm -hmm. like you're saying, to some capacity, we all have to make sure that we're mentally healthy. Mm -hmm. And so many times it has been misconstrued what mental health is actually. Yeah. And it's not that you're crazy. It's not that you, you're the only one that got all these issues. Mm -hmm. if, if we're really honest with ourselves, there comes a time in everyone's life when mm -hmm. our mental health is at stake, when our yeah. mental health is being compromised. Mm -hmm. And many times, in many cases, like you said, we don't like to discuss those things because it's pride. We want everybody to feel like, or to think that we got it all together. Yeah. Can you identify some factors or just talk to us about, so just help us brothers understand mm -hmm. when, when are some, when are some key moments in our lives when our mental state, our mental health could be at risk or could be compromised or we could be considered unstable? I think there's a lot of things that you can kind of take a look at. I think one, whenever there are any big transitions in your life, um, you know, like a lot of times that you would see a lot of issues as far as like kids, like, for example, like younger young men who are going through puberty, you know, that's a big emotional, like it's a lot of physical, physical changes, but it's a lot of emotional changes, you know, when you're getting into adulthood and, you know, you don't have as much support and different things kind of going on, you kind of trying to find your way as a man and to life, you know, and everything. I think as uh, when older men, you know, as they're trying to navigate issues with the job, um, you know, whether they're dealing with, you know, trying to get a job or whether or not they've been fired at that job they've been on for a long period of time. Um, and, you know, as far as, you know, as, you know, when they become a little bit older, when they're making transition out of the workforce. Yeah, I think big changes are times that you do want to watch out for that can be kind of triggers can also just be other issues as far as their personal life as well, too. Maybe there's some issues going on with their family. You know, that can be a big factor, you know, whether there's issues going on with the kids, whether issues going on with their spouse, whether issues going on with other family members. All those things can be stressors that can kind of contribute to issues popping up. Um, I think other thing as well, too, is also the physical well-being. There's a big link. There's a, a tremendous link when it comes to your physical well-being being linked to your, uh, you know, your mental and emotional well-being. And if you're not taking care of your body really well, that can also cause some issues as well, too. You know, specifically, if you're not eating right, if you're not getting enough sleep, a lot of emotional issues has to do with because we're not taking care of our bodies um, well. And if we can get that in check, a lot of times some of the other issues can also be improved as well, too. Also, when there's a lot of death, you know, when there's death in people's family, that's going to also be a big trigger for a lot of people as well, too, because that's just one of those things that can be really tough. And, you know, sometimes when we try to hold those things in, we try to ball it up, you know, it can have a lot of issues that can kind of pop out from that as well, too. That's great. I mean, you you said a, you said a lot and uh, in saying a lot, you really probably covered a large percentage of men mm -hmm. in that we we battle various things you know we 
we have this, of course, mantle to take care of our families. You know, even in the beginning of time, man have to work. A man don't work. A man don't eat. You know, mm-hmm. so if there are if there's scarcity in the job force, you know, or like you said, you get laid off on your job. Now yeah. you have to go home, face your wife, face your yeah. kids, mm-hmm. come th- with news. And sometimes some men feel like we failed. You know, mm-hmm. what am I going to do? I got to mm-hmm. provide for my family and they become stressors, you know. And so. You're exactly right. You know, I can really see how that can really affect you know, our mental capacity. Now, I have a question for you. And I know there is a, and I guess an ongoing debate to whether mental, I guess this is more, more so mental illness, but mental disorders or mental uh, transition, let's say, could be affected or could be hereditary. hereditary. Is, it, is it something that my father had, you know, issues mentally and there are some things that he dealt with that's now passed down to me and that has passed down to my kids. Is there anything that you could speak to? I know there's conversations and people are writing about it and there are statistics out there. I don't know if we can mm-hmm. quite pinpoint whether or not it can be hereditary, but can mental uh, illnesses uh, be hereditary? Yeah, and I'm yeah. actually glad that you mentioned that that was something I didn't happen to say a little bit earlier. You know, I think when it comes to uh, mental illness, there is a component you know, there is a biological component where you will that sometimes some people will inherit issues uh, that, you know, there are things that are in families as far as like sometimes depression runs in families, anxiety issues, even substance abuse issues run in families as well, too. And um, there's a there's definitely a, a biological component to it. It's not always the case. It's not to say that, hey, if you're if your mom or your dad dealt with this issue that you're guaranteed to deal with that same issue. But this is a chance, you know, there's a chance that you might deal with it because it is something that we do see, Um, you know, there's a biological component to it, you know, that can be inherited. But once again, also, there's other factors. Sometimes it's like a perfect storm where you might have the biological component, but it's not something that's active at the moment. But then you have a stressor that comes in your life. You know, something kind of hits. You might be fine most of your life and then something hits you. And now you become a lot more because you have that genetic component, you're a lot more susceptible to it. And that can be a factor. You know, there is the biological factor, but it's also the fact that, you know, sometimes there are things and habits and different things that we see because we see different things are how our family handles certain situations. You know, if you see that, you know, when it comes to a certain situation and that, you know, let's use, uh, use let's use substance abuse. Let's say if you've seen, you know, like, your father, your mother, they tend to drink when they have a lot of stress. There's a good chance that you're going to do the same thing because it's going to be a learned component to it. Sometimes some of the issues that we do have is, is because it's learned behavior as well, too. Uh, so there's a biological component. There's also a learned behavior as well, too, because you've seen people around you do those particular things. Once again, it, it's not a guarantee because sometimes, sometimes people can you know, have people in their family. They can see all those things. And they don't have any issues. So it's, it's definitely a case by case thing. But when you have all those things kind of, you know, happening around you, there's a high, ch- there's a higher chance uh, of you developing more mental issues uh, and having to deal with some of those issues um, than if you if your family didn't have to deal with that. Thanks for answering that, because I know, uh, you know, just even personally, you know, I know and I won't put any names out because I, I understand it you know, confidentiality, but there are times and, and not just in, in situations that I'm aware of, but more than more than off, often uh, mm-hmm. where if, like you mentioned, substance abuse and, you know, maybe a child witnesses their father, you know, drinking a lot and they're stressed and they come sure. home and they take their stress out on their spouses. You know, mm-hmm. now, you know, you have little, you know, little Jackson here that's watching their dad you know, beat their mom, you know, Mm -hmm. and now those things have would either cause you to, as you stated, you know, mimic those behaviors as you get Mm -hmm. older, or, you know, you may go total style. You may say, Hey, you know what? I grew up with this and I really don't want this in my life, but either way you're having to contend with those issues because of something that you witnessed in your household. And many Mm -hmm. times, in many cases, like you state, like you're saying, Sometimes we witness things in our household and we turn around 
and we become what we've seen all these many years, uh, not really knowing that, you know, all that time we hated it growing up, but then we, you know, we get into the household and it's mm-hmm. easy to become it if you're not careful. Yeah, um, yeah. What do you say to a gentleman that approaches you and say, man, I'm struggling because I've watched my dad or I've watched this situation happen. And, and here I am now as a man trying to fit for myself. How do you, and, and now you can put on your elder's hat along with your, uh, your mm-hmm. professional hat, but what do you say to a brother that struggles? I think the biggest thing you want to say to them is that, you know, there is there's another way. You know, sometimes when we see something happening, you know, for most of our life, we feel like, you know, that there are not many other options. This is the way that we do it. And you want to let them know, like, that's not you don't have to go that route. You don't have to be, you know, that person that you're seeing, you know, and and give them a, a roadmap. And I think, you know, this is one of the things about the Bible where it shows us how to be a man. It shows us how to be a good husband. It shows us how uh, to be a good, responsible member of society, you know, while we honor God in the things that we do. And I think that's the biggest thing is, you know, you whenever you see somebody who is dealing with issues and they're having trouble and they're, they're dealing with, you know, different issues in life, you want to give them hope. And hope is one of the strongest things that we have um, to prevent issues to become uh, harder. And I, I think, and I, I hope I don't misquote this, you know, I'm, I'm, I might, but you know, just have to forgive me on it. I'll just kind of paraphrase, you know, and it's like, if you, if you have a why, you can endure any what. And I think that's how it goes. And sometimes we, you know, we have to, or maybe the other way around, actually, now I'm thinking about it. <laughs> but if we have a reason why we're doing the things that we're doing, if we have something that we're looking towards, if we have something past this moment that we're working towards, we can endure a whole lot. And when you look at the Bible and what it promises you, you know, promise to the ones who are faithful, there's so much that we have to look forward to. And so oftentimes that hope is what gives us the strength to persevere through the different issues and problems. So if I was talking to, you know, a gentleman, I would give him hope. You know, I would give him hope, whether it's through the word, you know, I would give him hope that, you know, whatever he's dealing with in that moment of time, that he can get past it. You know, I think that's the biggest thing that we have to give people, because sometimes and there's a lot of people in this world right now who do not have hope. You'll be surprised. You should be surprised how many people who are walking around who do not have an idea or image that things can get better in life. And this is where, you know, as far as, you know, the mental health and especially as far as part of clergy, how we have to give people hope, letting them understand that there is something better. There is something better than this moment in which you're facing right now is better than, you know, the things that you saw growing up. Things can be better than that. And there's hope in Jesus Christ. And I think that's one of the biggest, you know, the biggest things that we have, especially being as Christians, we have hope in our Savior. Wow, that's powerful, man. That's powerful. Uh, one of the final questions here, uh, last two questions here. So in many times, in many cases, all right, when you talk to a lot of brothers, mm-hmm. a lot of brothers say, man, I ain't, I ain't emotional, man. I ain't, you know what I'm saying? I mean, we talk to a lot of brothers. A lot of brothers feel like they're not emotional. I'm not, you know, mm-hmm. I don't feel nothing. You know, I'm, 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 I'm just not, a, you know, I'm not just not an emotional guy. You know, mm-hmm. I don't cry. I don't, you know, cry at funerals. And, and because many times, and, and I, when I was a kid, I thought just because I didn't cry at funerals, that made me tough, you know, mm-hmm. and because I didn't cry, I was, you always taught as a, as a young man not to cry. You know, and if you did cry, you considered weak, you know, or you mm-hmm. considered a crybaby and all of those things. And then so people say you're not in touch with your emotions and no one wants to as a man. You don't want to be in touch with your emotions. You want to be tough. You want to be, yeah, mm-hmm. man, you know, get back out there, boy, you know. <laughs> but real quick, if you can kind of share with us, because from the last time I've I've heard and studied, I, and as we know, anger is an emotion. <laughs> and so many times we're running around beating on our chest saying, man, I'm not emotional, man. I don't feel anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but then as soon as somebody crossed you at the light, you know, you're cussing at them and telling them where they can go and, and everything else. So can you yeah. talk to us a little bit about the the emotion of anger? Yeah. 
you know, anger is one of those things that, you know, it, it pops up so much in, <laughs> in life and everything. And a lot of times people don't really recognize, you know, you know what it is and what it points to. Anger is one of those emotions. It, it is emotion, just to go, just, just, just like you said a little bit earlier, it's definitely emotion. So if you're getting angry all the time, you're very emotional. <laughs> you're very emotional. Um, the thing is, the trick with anger is that we want to make sure we show our anger the right way, you know, and, and trying to hold things in. What happens is a lot of times with people is that whenever they go through issues in life, they try to hold it in. They try to bottle up. Well, here's the problem with bottling up issues and problems. It, I'm kind of imagine, I, and this is a little example I usually use when, when I'm working with kids. Um, I usually kind of use example. I usually take a balloon. And so I say this, imagine this is a person. This balloon is a person. And I'll start blowing into the balloon. And as I'm blowing in the balloon, I say, this is all the things that you're going through. So whether it's anger, whether it's sadness, whether it's anxiety, all these different things, it's blowing in the balloon. So I'll start blowing the balloon. The balloon, of course, is going to get bigger. And after a while, the balloon is going to be pretty full with air. And I was like, what's going to happen? And I asked, what's going to happen if I keep blowing into this balloon? And most kids will say, well, it's going to pop. And I say, exactly. And this is exactly what happens to people a lot of time. They hold on to issues and problems and they do not let it out. And what happens is it's going to come out right. and it's going to come out in a way it's going to come out one when you least suspect it. And it's going to come out in a way that you don't want it to. We don't actually physically pop, but we do blow up. And sometimes we blow up at the wrong times and with the people that we love the most. And oftentimes anger is one of those things, it's one of those emotions, it's a secondary emotion that usually let us know that something else is wrong. There's something else that's wrong. And if we don't handle our anger the right way, we're going to end up blowing up. And we also have to learn the right way to let it out as well, too. Just like if I blow up a balloon and I just let that balloon go, it's just going to fly all over the place. It's going to be out of control. What you want to learn how to do is let out the anger in a controlled manner. You want to let it out a little bit at a time. So that way you're not blowing up. But at the same time, you're not flying all out of control. You need to let it out. And this is the one thing I think is really important when it comes to mental health. People have to learn healthy ways to deal with their issues and problems. And I think that's one of the biggest things when it comes to a lot of men. There's a lot of ways to let out, you know, that you're going to deal with your issues. You're going to cope with your issues. And, you know, in the field, we, we, we say this. Everyone has coping, uh, coping skills. Not all of them are good. Some people drink. Some people smoke. You know, some people lash out at people. Some people hit other people. You know, they abuse other people, whether it's physically, emotionally, you know, other ways. But you're going to cope with your issues, but not all of them are healthy ways. You have to learn how to cope with your issues in healthy, responsible ways that not only help you, but also help the people around you. When you're not helping, when you're not dealing with your issues and your emotions, not only are you hurting yourself, but you're help hurting the people around you. And if you keep hurting the people around you long enough, then they're going to distance themselves from you. And when they distance themselves from you, it's only going to make your problem worse because now you have even less support. That's why it's so important to deal with our issues. That's one of the things that that's, uh, it's, it, it hurts so much when you see someone going through issues and they, they're not aware of why they're dealing with what they're dealing with. That's half the battle right there. It's the awareness the, you know, that I have issues. Anger is a great tool if you use it the right way. It, it lets you know that there is something wrong. But if you ignore the fact that you're getting angry all the time, because it is not healthy to get angry all the time, that, that should be a tall tale sign. It, it's healthy to be angry. But if you're angry almost every day, if you're angry most of the day, that's a problem. You know, that's a problem. You know, if you everybody's making you angry, it's probably not the other people. It's probably you. And that should be a sign to let you know, I need to do something about it. You know, I need to get some help. You know, we can't handle all our problems by ourselves. You know, there are people who are there who are willing to help and support you. And we have to sometimes we have to swallow our pride and we have to reach out to those people. You know, so. That's rich. Uh, I'm reminded of Genesis chapter four with Cain and Abel. 
Mm-hmm. You know, when you're dealing with anger and, and, and you mentioned a lot of good stuff there, you know, when Cain just couldn't take the fact that God accepted his offering, Abel's offering and didn't accept his, you know, mm-hmm. so much so where he was blowing, like you said, in that balloon, that mm-hmm. balloon was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. God asked Cain a question. And he ignored God. And I said, Cain, what's, what's, what's up, man? You know, and mm-hmm. like you said, those are indicators and Cain's still blowing in that balloon. Can't believe Abel get the offering. Can't believe he get to ride in the bins. I can't believe he get to do this or that. And, and God asked him, he said, if, you know, if you do what's right, won't I bless you too? And then he said, if you do what's wrong, here's what's happening. Sin is crouching at your door. And like you mentioned, I think many times in many cases, we get angry. The Bible says be angry, but sin not. Which yeah. means yeah. anger, like you said, is a part of our nature, is a, is a part of the emotion that, you know, that we all face with. Jesus got angry and he overturned tables, you know? Mm-hmm. So anger is emotion that is okay if used properly. Mm-hmm. But if we're not using it and we're just keeping it, keeping it all in and eventually we let it out. And so that's powerful because when you look at Cain, the Lord says sin is crouching at your door and anger is something that the enemy uses all the time, especially for men. We get angry and now we want to get we want to get tough. We want to get big and we start throwing our weight around and we start mm-hmm. doing mm-hmm. stuff that's out of character. And, yeah. and, and again, little Rodney, you know, is, is, is watching, you know. Mm-hmm. And so sin is crouching at the door. And that's just powerful because can you can you help us with now? You mentioned getting help. Mm-hmm. When I have an anger issue, I've got a problem. Number one, I, I do understand me that I need to take it to the Lord in prayer. But mm-hmm. is there anybody else also that you would recommend? Is there anyone else? I mean, as a profession, I mean, what do we do if we're having issues all the time? You wake up, you're mad. Somebody say good morning. What's good about it? You know, I mean, everything you turn around to the left, everything irritates you, everything annoys you. Those, as you said, are signs that there is something else. And it's not everybody else. It's you. I have a problem. Where do I go? What do I do when I have an issue? Yeah, I mean, there's a Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, there's a lot of places that you can go. There's a lot of counseling agencies and different uh, professionals who are there to help you. You can go online. Uh, there's um, quite a few places, like a couple of websites you can go to. Um, you can actually uh, want to say psychologytoday.com, um, if I'm not mistaken, that you can go to that. Um, if there's a big issue, you can always, you know, especially if you're thinking, let's say if it's not just anger, let's say if you're dealing with depression and especially if you're thinking about um, harming yourself, there's some hotlines. There's a suicide hotline. There's a crisis line that you can call. And they'll and then not only will they talk to you, but also they'll put you, um, they'll put you with different agencies that'll be willing to help you as well, too. You know, there are a lot of professions. The other thing as well, too, you know, talking to, you know, leaders in your church as well. And they'll also point you to the right direction. Not only will they give you counsel if they feel like that's something that you need to actually go to get a counselor or a therapist to work with. They'll definitely point you in the right direction. You know, the thing is, is just reaching out and talking to people, you know, talking to someone. You know, also, that's another thing I am actually almost forgot. Also, talking to your doctor, you know, your primary care physician. If you tell them about the different issues they go to, they'll also give you referrals um, to uh, to different counseling agencies. Also through your insurance company, your insurance company that and now actually if you have insurance and you definitely want to make sure that um, that you want to find someone who uses your insurance. If you call your insurance company, they have a list of different providers in the area uh, that can help you. So there's a lot of different ways to get in contact with, you know, an agency or somebody that can help you. But sometimes we just got to take that first step and, you know, just, you know, just to try to ask, OK, I need help. You know, these are the places that you can go to first. And just to kind of talk about just one more thing about that, you know, I think that's another part that, you know, I kind of talked about the stigma of it. Um, you know, sometimes people have an image of what therapy is like. You know, they feel like that, hey, you know, when I, I go to the therapy office, I'm going to sit on the couch and somebody's just going to talk to me. You know, they're going to just I'm going to be telling about all my issues and problems. And it's not like that. You know, if you if your thought of therapy is what you see on TV, that is not like that. You know, it's very different. You know, a professional is going to, you know, when you first and just to kind of give a if you don't mind, I'm going to give a kind of overview of what usually happens when you do meet with a professional. Uh, but when you meet with a professional, 
uh, when you first meet with them, they're going to definitely kind of, they're going to do, um, they're going to pretty much do an assessment just to kind of see what type of issues and problems that you're having. And this is where you kind of give them some background history. You kind of tell them about the issues and problems that you're having, how long it's happened, you know, different ways it's affecting you. They'll get some basic information about you. But then after what they're going to do after they gather their information, they're going to develop a treatment plan. And this is where you and that professional are going to work together and going to have a roadmap of what specific things we need to work on in order to make your life a little bit better. And that's the whole thing about it is making your life a little bit better. The thing is, a lot of times we when we go there, we feel like, you know, this person is going to read my mind. No, you got to talk to them. You know, the thing is, the more honest you are in the session, the more you get out of it. And the thing is, that person is going to be working with you. And I think that's a key part of it as well, too, is that they're going to be working with you. But you got to meet them. You got to meet them halfway. It's not going to be, you know, I'm just going to go there and they're going to fix me. It doesn't work that way. It's something that's a process that you have to work together. But it's OK. You know, it's going to be a process. Don't expect the problems to just be solved just like that. You didn't get there overnight. And also to get past those problems is going to take a little bit of time and a little bit of work. And I think that's one of the things, you know, throughout the process, they're going to be working with you. They're going to be holding you accountable. You know, I think that's another thing that's going to be a little tough sometimes to get, you know, they got to hold you accountable, you know, to what you're doing. But once again, it's just somebody you're going to be talking with. And here's the other thing as well, too. You don't have to go just because you're dealing with depression or you're dealing with, you know, major, you know, general, uh, general anxiety or any other major issues. Sometimes if you just want to talk just to get some things off your chest, that's a good place to go. Sometimes the best medicine we can get is the preventative medicine. And that's something that we can also do as well, too, by going there. Pray that this has been a blessing to you guys. It has been a blessing to me. It's always good to share with Elder Mario. He's always he's always got a word, but he also has good insight and good information. Uh, he's a trained and a licensed professional. And, and we're really very grateful to have him on board to really show us, teach us about mental health and mental illnesses. So thank you so much for coming on. On behalf of our bishop, Thank you all so much for tuning in. We love you guys, and we're excited about everything that the Lord is doing going forward. Thank you so much for joining us. Did Oh, wow. What a discussion we had with Elder Mario today. It was so powerful, a lot of information. We pray that that information has blessed you as well as it has blessed me. Checking on our mental stability, checking on our mental health, several factors that can factor in to us being mentally unstable. Anger is an emotion. Brothers, we learned a lot tonight, and I pray that you have taken that information and you can go back and assess and say, man, and the question is, am I healthy mentally? And if the question is, I'm not sure, I'm always angry at somebody, I'm always irritated, I'm always annoyed, then maybe, just maybe, we need to seek some help. We need to seek some guidance. We need to talk to the Lord. We need to really ask God, Lord, help me with this anger problem. Help me, Lord, to become mentally stable. Being mentally unstable does not mean that you're crazy. It does not mean that you got all kind of issues. If the truth of the matter of is we're all, you know, we all have issues. We all got problems. We all got things that we need the Lord to help us to better ourselves. All it takes sometimes is one bad phone call. And now mentally, emotionally, it just changed everything. So please take what we discussed today to heart. We're going to come back and share more information. But I hope you were blessed tonight as well as I was. So again, thank you so much for tuning in. May God bless you and may God keep you is our prayer.